introduce our speaker. I just met him this morning with a very familiar voice. <laughs> so Randy Rowland is the voice of the Seahawks. Dr. Randy Rowland is a longtime Seattle resident, spent years in broadcasting, working at Keeney Broadcasting Company. He's been in the public address announcement for the Seahawks since 1991. And in addition, he's also the voice for the University of Washington Husky Marching Band. He holds master's and doctoral degrees from Florida Theological Seminary. He and I were comparing Presbyterian churches we both know people at. Randy has a deep interest in music, movies, and sports, and how all the aspects of popular culture can be explored to communicate relevant truths. Married to Nancy, they have two children, Rachel and Andy. He is an avid scuba diver, reader, moviegoer, and boater. He's also authored two books, Get a Life, and the sins we love. I don't like that. <laughs> Great titles both. I want to make sure read both. You can get those on Amazon, by the way. So in addition to loving God and football, Randy enjoys reading and cinema and travel and any chance to get out of the water in a boat. Would you please welcome Randy Roland? They gave me one of these so I could prance. Good morning. It is a good morning, right? Okay, good. It is great to see you. Um, as, as I begin this morning, I've been asked to share a little bit. Carl said, make sure people know about you. So uh, in, in 1953, Chuck and Audrey Rowland, uh, Fairly newly married couple, Audrey being from England, World War II matchup, uh, and my uh, my parents uh, didn't think they could have any additional children. Their first child was deeply damaged. My brother Mikey, who is still alive, and I look after him. Anyway, I was raised in this family. My dad was one of these responsible, caring, nice guys that every every one of their adult friends kids wanted to come and consult with about, his, about their life. A lot of them wound up in the Air Force, by the way. Um, little, little promotion. And, um, and I don't know if you know what it's like to grow up with a colonel, but, but I have great colonel stories. So you're, you're at the colonel's house, you're a colonel's child, you have a bowl of oatmeal, and the colonel says, finish your oatmeal. And you look and you say, well, you know, I'm pretty full and all that, plus there's a fly in my oatmeal. To which the colonel will say, that is not a fly, that's a raisin, eat your oatmeal. <laughs> Dad, I, I just don't really want to eat the oatmeal. Do you want to eat the oatmeal, Randy, or would you like me to put it down your throat? <laughs> oh, okay. So get my spoons, go, and this fly manages in its death throes to take off and fly. And, and Colonel Rowling goes, now that is the first time I have ever seen a flying raisin. <laughs> so if you've got a colonel, you know that they're seldom, seldom wrong, right? He's had a lot of fun in that. My dad was also a sober-minded guy, and I'm a wise guy. My mom was a was very, very funny countryside English girl. Quit school at the age of 13 and worked in the factories. She was funnier than funny. My dad get really mad and say, shut up, funny man. You know, you get all these things going on. He goes, if you don't make any money with that mouth of yours, you know, on me. And, and he, he never took that back. And, and at 87, as he, as he lay in uh, Harrison Memorial Hospital right here, passing away, uh, a week before he died, he looked at me and he said, Randy, I was all wrong. I said, what? What? Because so apologies were never really abundant in the household, and, 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 and so he says, I, I'm sorry, I was wrong. You can make money with that mouth. <laughs> so, Thanks, 30 years later, you know, I mean, we, we finally settled that one out. So it seems like um, I've been a guy whose uh, main vocation has been uh, air coming out between his lips, uh, whether it's in broadcasting, uh, sports announcing, or I was a disc jockey for a time, or, or then being a pastor and, and all of that. And it's a real privilege to be with you this morning. Um, I don't know, how many of you were brought up in more traditional churches and denominations? Okay. Well, for those people who did that, 
uh, and, and I really wasn't raised in church, but when I started going to church, it was a traditional Presbyterian church that, um, that drew me in. It was in my neighborhood, university place. And we had seasonal decorations. So the pulpit and the lectern and the church and the big would put these banners out. And, you know, it was a way of symbolizing faith. But for me, my faith was the number one thing in my life. My beloved Nancy's number two, Rachel and Andy, my kids are tied, and everything else comes in. But I do think an occasional seasonal decoration is really important for promoting certain spiritual values. For those of you who are really, really pious, I am in the doghouse. But for the rest of you, I hope you enjoyed that, because I, um, okay, well, I'm, I'm privileged to be here today. Well, I got the call from Carl. We met at a retreat a year ago this month and uh, got an opportunity to come here. Uh, this is a community that I've known a lot of years. I came here and stole my wife from Silverdale, chased her for eight cotton picking years from college and, and find her, finally grabbed her up at the top of uh, the road right across the street. She lived in the house working with Young Life right across the street from Central Kids Have High. And uh, that was 34 years ago I stole her from you. And, I don't regret it at all, um, and it, it's, been a, it's been a great time. This morning, I want to share with you, and I, I want to be somewhat autobiographical, because I think your story and everyone here's story and my story are important, and I think we become more connected as human beings. We enter into the area of spirit much easier through story than say somebody getting up and giving up, you know, systematic case of theology. I can do that. I've got the whole. I've got the doctorate. I can teach you Greek words that mean nothing in English and everything. That's what I spent money on. But what I really like to do is hear and tell the stories. The Hebrew is really a waste. We won't talk about that. Um, okay. So I want. I want to start in here in all seriousness, and I'm going to be borrowing from a piece of popular literature to um, engage the topic that will come out of the New Testament this morning. And again, a privilege to be with you and share this. So there's this young girl, Tricia McFarlane. She stopped alongside the trail that she and her family were hiking across the Appalachian Trail. She needed to go to the bathroom. Um, she, she lagged behind her family. She stepped off into the woods, took care of her business, and when she came out, Somehow, she was on the wrong trail. Can you imagine this little, little girl, crazy, lost in the Appalachian wilderness and alone, yelling, no contact with her family. Very, very scary situation. This is the setting for Stephen King's novel, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Now, Tom Gordon, by the way, how many of you know who Tom Gordon is? Tom Gordon, number 38 with the Boston Red Sox, was a legendary 90s uh, uh, relief pitcher and closer. I mean, he, he, he was just a brilliant closer, won MVP for that. He was also a devoted Christian. He'd come to the pulpit, he'd come out with his glove, and he'd say a quick prayer, and then every time he struck somebody out, he praise God, and then he would walk off the mound if he wanted and put his hand way up in the air, and credit Jesus as his source of strength and, and his faith and as a center to his life. He did that in radio. It was just wonderful for those, for someone representing the faith, a real guy with a real story, right? And Tricia had fallen in love with him. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up, the, you know, as a fan, I'm gonna pick up this story and use it this morning. Tricia fought her way through a tangle of trees that were so close together, they were almost intertwined. They came out in the little crescent of a clearing where the brook took an elbow bend to the left. It looked like a little patch of Eden to Tricia. There was even a fallen tree trunk for a bench. So, you can imagine being lost in the wood, she sat down, closed her eyes, and tried to pray for rescue. Now, however, praying was hard. Neither of her parents were churchgoers. Her mom, a lapsed Catholic, her dad, so far as Trisha knew, never had anything to lapse from. <laughs> so 
she discovered herself in this situation without vocabulary. She said, our father, and it came out of her mouth flat, uncomforting, about as useful as an electric can opener would have been out in the Appalachian Trail. She couldn't remember discussing spiritual matters with her mother, but she asked her father not a month ago if he believed in God. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So she asked her dad, do you believe in God? God, said Larry McFarland, now I'll tell you what I believe. I believe in the sub-audible. The what, she says, looks at him. Do you remember when we lived on 4th Street? It had electric heat in the house. You remember how the baseboard units would hum even when they weren't heating, even in the summer? She's shaking her head. And he says, that's because you got used to it. But take my word, Trisha, that sound was always there. Even in a house where there aren't baseboard heaters, there are noises, the fridge goes on and off, pipes, down, floors creak, traffic goes by outside. We hear those things all the time, but most of the time we don't really hear them. They become, and Tricia fills in, the suboptimal. Precisely, he says, precisely, sugar, I don't believe in any thinking God that marks the, the fall of every bird. Sorry, I put his eyes on the sparrow, but, but he doesn't believe in this. And that marks every bird that falls in Australia or every bug in India, a God that records all our sins in a big golden book and then judges us when we die. But I believe there has to be something, yes, something, some sort of insensate force for the good. Insensate, you know what that means? Trisha nods. And then he says, there's something that keeps most of us from dying in our sleep. No perfect, all-loving God, I don't think evidence supports that, but a force. The subaudible, she said, you got it. Do you believe in anything else, Dad? Oh, the usual, death, taxes, and that you're the most beautiful little girl in the world. So here's this book, Patricia McFarland's Lost in the Woods. Stephen King is actually Trisha McFarland. You see, he was out on a walk, having forgotten all about God in his life. He was on a walk in Maine, and he got mowed over by a car and nearly killed. Spent the better part of a year in the hospital. And he returned to his Roman Catholic faith in a very evangelical way, and has ever since been in a deep and deepening relationship with God and Jesus Christ. And this book was his coming out of faith that he wrote his story of being lost in the woods. So here it is. This girl's lost in the woods, sensing that there must be something more. And then she remembers her baseball hero, the great closer of the Boston Red Sox, number 38, Tom Flash Gordon. He pulls out miraculous saves again and again when he wins. He points a finger at the sky to credit a personal God who he names as Jesus. And well into her nine-day trial, being bucked, bitten, scared, cut, sick from drinking bad water, poisoned from eating bad berries, she pleads to a personal God to bring her out of the woods. And listen to this prayer that she comes. Please, God, help me find the path. She thought, closed her eyes. It was the God of Tom Gordon she prayed to, not her father, subaudible. She needed a God that was really there, one that you could point to when and if you got saved. Please, God, please help me here in the late innings. And as the story goes on, Trisha wanders through all this peril and somehow stumbles out, unscathed, onto a road. A car was coming. She was rescued, returned to her family. And, and obviously, the hand of God enters into this picture. Encountering God, I think, friends, is something we, we all long for, right? Many of us. But we also fear it a little bit. There's a lot of us that fear encountering God. Uh, but growing up at our supper home, out on, how many of you know where Treasure Island is out in Grapeview? That's where I grew up as a child. And my wife and I just bought a place out in Mason Lake. So we're going to be out here with you. Um, but, but I grew up on Treasure Island a lot. 
And I remember walking late at night, sneaking out of my tent, walking around the island, and feeling that there was this presence and wonder around me. I thought it was the Indian Great Spirit or the Southern Audible. It wasn't. It was warm and it was it was gracious, but I couldn't have put a name on it or a personal. So this is my introduction, maybe to God, that happened to me even before my conversion to Jesus Christ, because God was this warm, distant presence there, not intrusive. My vision, my version, I think, of the subaudible. Um, and I guess it was more of a fear for me of getting close to God and it letting God get too close to me that I didn't want to face. I wanted God, but I didn't want God to have me. Um, and I came to understand fairly quickly from talking to people that if you enter into this God thing, uh, you enter in with him as the boss, and you're on the other end of that stick. And I think I wanted to try to enter as the boss and, uh, and see if I could get God to work part time for me. <laughs> right? Okay. And, and I fear talking about how God might be directly at work in my life. I think a lot of us, even people of us who call ourselves Christian and have lived what we call faithful lives, are so quiet about our faith, it might as well be the subhonorable. Right? For a lot of us. But, but it's not. God's for real. God's personal. God's actively seeking a relationship with each and every one of us through Jesus Christ. And the cool part of that is, if you know Jesus already, he's pursuing you. He's seeking a relationship with you. I'll talk a little bit about my experience in a few minutes. If you've not entered into that relationship, um, God has the same disposition. He's pursuing you. He's saying, say yes to my yes to you. And become a part of an adventure and a relationship that is beyond your imagination. I want to read from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Talk about it a little bit. You all that have read the scripture know this, but it's a beautiful passage. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him, all things were created. Things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him, in him, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and firstborn from the dead, so that everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased, listen to this line, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. The word reconcile means repair. It comes from the word knitting. It means knit back together the fabric that is torn. Jesus has come to, re to reconcile our society, to reconcile us with each other, and to reconcile us with God the Father. He's, he's here with a big pair of knitting needles, putting it all back together. And, and for me, that thing where it, where it says in here, he's before all things and all things he's held together. How many of us in the strains of our culture feel like we're, we're coming apart and we're, we're about ready to go to smithereens? Mm -hmm. Look at the way that that affects people around us. Look at the violence and alienation that it promotes. And, and here's one who holds all things together. You got a hope of being together, a hope rests in Jesus. Now, anyone here can invite Jesus Christ into their life, but some of us confuse God's offer of love and a desire to help reorient our lives. And we have these weird thoughts about God. And I, and I worked in young life, I work with college students, I work with young adults, I work with young couples, I have two churches, I work with singles, uh, and now um, I'm, at the, I'm at the risky tipping point. I've done about 400 weddings and 100 funerals in my career, and if I don't get two more weddings, 
this year, I'm going to have done more funerals and weddings for the first time in my career. Uh, not my not my favorite thing. Um, but here's the fears I've heard for, for people. God's going to place unreasonable demands on me if I give my life to him. Two, I'll become some kind of weird Old Testament prophet or something like Ezekiel. I'll grow hair, walk around in a camel suit, lay in the dirt, and say strange things, and wobble around. You read Ezekiel, you know, and it kind of, kind of freaks you out a little bit. And I'm not the kind of person who can have uh, faith and hear God and know God personally. I just hang out with a religious crowd and I do my best, but I don't think God could break through and talk to me. I'm just, I'm just not that kind of person. That doesn't work for me. Another one was, I'm, I'm afraid to become a, a fanatic or having deeply spiritual experiences that weird me out and change my life and confuse me. How, how many people look at becoming a Christian and think they're going to wind up be, the, being the guy wearing the sandwich sign and the bullhorn that hasn't showered for seven weeks out in front of the Seahawk game? Right and, yeah, thanks for the great moral example. There. You know. So, anyway, perhaps we'd all be really good to acknowledge our plight in life isn't very much different than Tricia McFarland. We're walking along, we're surrounded by community and family. We take a couple of false steps and we're lost in the weeds. Potentially for good. And we're alone and alien. We're afraid. We're angry. We're defensive. We're lost. We're hopeless. Looks a lot like the world we live in today, even here in the divided states of America. Perhaps too many of us allow ourselves to join the ranks of the 90% of Americans who say, yeah, I believe in God, whether I go to church or not. But when you really start talking to people who say, yeah, I believe in God and I pray some, God starts sounding a lot like this sub-audible. I've had so many people in churches where I've served in retreats I've gone to that say, man, you, you messed with me because that sub-audible is how I've been living my life as a Christian. And uh, if you've been doing that, I'm calling you out today. It's, it, it's, not, it's not enough. Let me take a couple of minutes to tell the story of this 64-year-old adopted boy. And here's Jesus in common. I was uh, a raving pagan in high school. I mean, I did the 60s, and I know I did because loving family and friends have reconstructed many of the stories that I can't remember for me. I did the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing with absolute panache. A-plus performance, honors, the whole 60s thing, right? I don't, I don't think I spent a day that I wasn't stoned in high school going to classes. Might have affected my GPA, because when I quit, I came to the Lord and quit smoking pot, my GPA went up about a point and a half. <laughs> Therefore, Steve Martin was right when he talked about smoking marijuana. So let's get stupid. Um, but here's a story. You, you remember, so many of you here remember back into the 60s and early 70s. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have car phones. We didn't have answering machines. Remember that? You had your green or pink princess phone on the counter or turquoise or pink, what two awful colors you had to choose between, right? <laughs> and so, I can't remember what, we had one of each, I can't remember what color the phone was, it rings, and my dad, Chuck, jumps up from the dinner table, opens it, hello, well, hello, Alla Pritchard, hello, Alla, how are you doing? How's Bob doing? And, well, everybody in the community, and, uh-huh, uh-huh, we, oh, you've invited Stephanie to Young Life, and you'd like her to come? Why, at 7.30 tonight at the Prince? Oh, yes. Um, if any of you knew Becky, Becky and Jim Brown, who served here a number of years, this was Becky Brown, who was then Becky Princeton, has invited my sister. And this older woman invites her. And my dad says, the colonel, yeah, I'll have the boy drive her. And I'm like, no, oh, no. But you can't argue with the colonel, because if he owns the car, you argue with the colonel. Uh, either, my dad didn't hit me, but I wore hippie shirts with the long puffy cuffs. And he had a great way of, when he was angry enough, just kind of ripping my shirts off. Um, <laughs> and so an argument that resulted in my orange and orange with bright green polka dot hippie shirt with 
puffy sleeves and six buttons being torn off, so I knew when to back off. Got, went into my room, got some of my dad's, I got about 18, dad was a B-17 guy, I got so many uh, original aviator glasses from World War II, so I put a pair on, uh, being the disrespectful young thing I was, I rolled a couple of joints of marijuana in American flag cigarette paper, <laughs> stuffed them in my pocket, took my sister to Young Life in University Place, Washington, went to Curtis High School, pulled into this call center. I thought, well, Steph, I'll see you in an hour if the thing lasts longer. Let's go. I'll be back in plenty of time. My sister and I got along great. She goes, I'm going to tell mom and dad you blew this off. Go and have a good time. And I used to go to the place where now it was a big overlook of the gravel pit. Now it turned it into a golf course. It ruined my pot smoking place. But I'd go there and smoke up and watch the beautiful sunset in University Place, right by the graveyard where my grandparents were buried, right behind me. And and uh, sometimes I'd go pay a visit there. But I pull into this cul-de-sac, and every good-looking girl at Curtis High School and a bunch of guys pulled in behind me in the cul-de-sac and parked, and I was trapped at this sucker, absolutely trapped. There was nowhere to go. And then these people start going, oh, Randy, come to Young Life. You'll like it. I hope so. I don't know. But, you know I'll sit in my car and smoke pot. I don't, I don't care. Arrest me, bust me, I, I, I'm no young life. And um, they just kind of grabbed me and hauled me in and sat me down. And I laughed my rear end off at the gags they did, found a few of the songs capturing me. And I mentioned to you that I walk around my beach place in Treasure Island and sense this great spirit or presence that I couldn't define. So God in his providence has selected on this evening a guy who I've admired my whole life, named Tom Tool, to stand up. You ever heard of the golfing gorilla? He became the golfing gorilla. Tom stands up and opens up the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and reads this amazing story where Jesus is in a boat with his 12 closest students. They're going across the lake, and he's tired, honestly, and a storm sets in. Boat starts getting a little leaky. Jesus is back there sleeping in the back end. And being the boating guy who loves the water and doesn't get seasick, I'm going, I can relate to Jesus here. That's easy. Um, but they, the, these disciples freak out. They wake him up and they go, Don't you even care about us? We're drowning. There's fire in the boat. You know, and they're they're freaking out, right? And and getting getting pretty freaky. And uh, and there are these convection winds that blow through the Sea of Genesis or Galilee. Even though it's not the hugest lake, you can get eight, ten foot waves, and nothing built then really handled that all that well. Inland waters. So Jesus just says, stop. The waves fall down, the wind goes away, the rain stops. And he says, Okay, little faiths, row us to the other side. And the disciples just look at Jesus, lays back down. And they all look at each other in a circle and go, what did we just see? And they ask this rhetorical question, who is this man that even the wind and the waves would obey him? And my lifetime friend Tom Tool looked and said, hey folks, you, you bunch of, because he went to Wilson High School, bunch of Curtis Vikings, when you go home tonight, I'm going to ask you to do this one thing. When you put your head on your pillow, I want you to either ask the question, who is this man that the wind and the waves obey him? Or if you want to do another thing, get more personal and say, Lord, if you're this man that the wind and the waves obey, make yourself known to me. I'm going to ask you to either repeat that line or pray that prayer tonight. Good night, have a great week, see you next Monday night. And I felt like somebody had put a splitting wall into the solid eight foot wide, because I was a big guy then, soul of mine, and just struck it with a mallet and split my soul in two. I was, I was useless for this world from, from that day forward. Something in me was just grabbed. 
And I realized that for all my running, all my ignoring Christian friends, all my ignoring time, few times that I went to church, all my ignoring anybody that wanted to share about God with me, um, that I was absolutely tackled from behind by Jesus on that evening. And that was in March of 1970. And it seems to have stuck. <laughs> and it's been my, my guiding, guiding, guiding uh, principles. So may I just summarize for a minute here for us. First of all, God loves every single person he's created. And I mean the, almost the Aristotelian Greek, Greco-Roman version of love, not the kind of sappy thing we talk about. Or, hey, I really like the Tran, you know, I do. And he's related to a guy that's one of the first baseball cards I ever owned. Um, but God's love is different than that. It's, it's like the Aristotelian love, to seek the absolute highest good for another. And God invests himself in that business for you and me. Wounded, broken, people who disappointed him because he created our world to be so beautiful and he created us to be so beautiful and so capable of love and compassion. And we've, we've, we've drifted away from that. We're broken, we're fallen, and we're lost in the woods like Tricia. And God loves us. In fact, God loves you beyond your wildest imagination. I used to say it like this. God is crazy about you. Crazy about you. There's nothing you can do, whether you know him or not, to get him to love you more or less. His love for you is absolute, perfect, minus or plus anything. He loves you in a way that you can't possibly imagine being loved and having your highest good sought for. And he's overjoyed to be our guide and pathway in this life into eternal life. And he became one of us in Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life and showed us the way of God and promised to become our lifetime companion, a God with skin on. Do you realize the, the, the outrageousness of Christian faith is that our God jumped into a bag of skin and bones of blood and hung out with us for 33 years. He fully understands what it means to be human. He understands what it feels like to not have your friends. Won't one of you stay up and pray with me in the garden of Gethsemane before he died on the cross? My God, my God, you've ditched me. You've forsaken me, put this. And in the midst of all that, Jesus knew perfectly what it was to be human. And we look at him and we see what it means to be a perfect human. So this Jesus suffered violence at the hands of human beings and our sinfulness in order to close the gap between us and holy God. He died on the cross to repair this breach that's been between God and humanity and to offer, he died for everyone for the forgiveness of sins. So here's the sad part. You and I have friends around us who have not responded to the story. Jesus has forgiven them, but they don't know it and they haven't entered into a relationship with him. How do you feel about people that you, you really love? Maybe somebody here. Jesus died for you. If you don't know the Lord, he wants you to be a part, not to judge you, not to look you around. I've been a Christian now for 40 some years and none of those fears about being smitten, smoked, smited, disciplined, None of those things have ever been true for me. I've been showered in love and grace and mercy and encouraged by God to have that be my external behavior toward every single human being I encounter. This is how God changed lives, all of our lives. And so, after three days in the grave, Jesus rose again and ascended into heaven and continues from there to pursue every one of us and I want to offer every one of us here an opportunity two things. If you're one of my friends in Christ who has allowed yourself to kind of slump into this place where you're living the sub-audible, let's turn up the volume, folks. Okay? 
But give some real thought this morning in, our, in my prayer that I'll ask you to kind of follow along with me with, to, to, to not settle for the subaudible. When we live in the presence of a living God who will speak right to us and guide us and give us wisdom, my goodness, let's not settle for the subaudible. If you're languishing personally because of that, let's take care of that today. If you're someone who's been hearing about this Jesus thing, somebody called you here this morning, paid for your breakfast. That wasn't bribery, that Jesus doesn't bribe anyone into the faith. But we did have a little inducement to get you here. Um, and if you are somebody who's been considering Jesus Christ intellectually, emotionally, this might just be the morning for you to pray the prayer where you say, Jesus, I have been at the center of my life. I'm not doing such a great job. I'd like to switch places with you. I'd like you to occupy the center of my life. So I'd like to pray together. Will you please join me? Lord, first of all, thank you for creating this world. I just was blown away by the size of the universe again and again and that you hold it all together. In fact, it says, Jesus, in him all things hold together. But your creation itself is beautiful. You made us in a way that we can know you and hear you and walk with you. And, and you've made us hungry for you. And we, we've tried hedonism, pleasurism, consumerism, narcissism, every ism in the world to occupy that spot that should be you in our lives. So God, once again, you've made us hungry for you. Keep us hungry. Help these restless hearts find their rest in you. God, there are some here now who want and need to know you for the first time, absolutely. And those of us who are thirsty here can follow this prayer. You don't have to pray this out loud, but follow me. Jesus, I want you to be in my life in living color, at the center of my very being. I turn away from my attempts to avoid you, to make you subaudible, to be self-sufficient. I surrender. I ask you to forgive my wandering and mercifully come into my hungry heart. Wet my dry spirit with your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Without reservation, I invite you into my life as my Savior, as my Lord, as my guide, as my companion, and as my friend. And I ask that you would make me your own. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for coming today. I also want to point out that on the table, you will see some envelopes, and maybe I can get someone at this table to hold up the envelope so you can see. So this, this envelope has some cards. If, if you need prayer, if you have a response to the call to faith and you want to know Jesus and know more about him and want to connect and let your faith be public, I think Romans 10.10 10 says, you believe in your heart that um, Jesus is real and you confess him with your mouth, you shall be saved. It's really important if you make that first step of faith that you share it with someone. And this card would be a great, safe way to do it. So fill that out. Let us know what we can do for you. And uh, please, uh, have a great, great day to day as you go out. And uh, listen for the sub-audible.